Volleyball has been one of the hottest fall sports this season, but was it able to rebound from the tough loss against Niagara last week that snapped a seven-game win streak? It was opening weekend for the men's ice hockey team as it welcomed defending Hockey East Tournament champions Northeastern for a weekend series. Also, the women's ice hockey team hit the road this weekend to take on UConn and New Hampshire. The women's soccer team came into this weekend 2-2 two two in the MAC, so its matches against Manhattan and Canisius had playoff implications. Were the Bobcats able to pull out wins? And we have the latest edition of Top 5 Plays. Who would claim the top spot? Lots of good plays to choose from. Sports Ball starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Sports Paws. I'm Sierra Goodwill. And I'm Andrew Badillo. Sierra, it's that time of year again. The fall foliage is at its peak and so is conference play for the fall sports teams. Playoffs are starting to creep in to the minds of all the athletes. You're right, Andrew. The volleyball team is definitely in that same boat. The volleyball team started off 6-0 in MAC play this season, but last week, Kanisha snapped its streak. On Saturday, the Bobcats hosted the reigning MAC champs, Fairfield, hoping to get back on track. Let's see how they did. At the Burt Con Court, Fairfield 8-0 in the MAC before this game. Quinnipiac starting off in the first set, doing what they know best, blocking shots. Allison Lee and Jen Coffey team up for that one. Staying here in the first set, Jen Coffey gets blocked. A lot of scrappy back and forth play. That's how the story of the first two sets went, but Fairfield with the upper hand, a kill down the line by Megan Thieler. Quinnipiac actually up by one at this point. Chris Plinsky talking to his players, make sure they hold on to that league. But Fairfield ultimately got the best, an absolute kill from the middle hitter, Skylar Day. Fairfield wins the first set 25-22. Heading now into the second set, another close one. Jen Coffey drives it cross court. Andrew, this ball is nearly impossible to dig up for the defense. An absolute killer. Pile drive. Yeah, absolutely. But here, a nice roll ball Fairfield takes advantage of. Runs a black slide, Fairfield wins the second set, 25-23, and the third set. Yeah, I think um, this game was kind of a wake-up call, and I think practices are going to be a lot tougher now. We know that um, they're the best in the conference. That's who we need to beat um, at the end of the year, and so I think it's going to ramp up practices and make uh, every game a lot more important. The matchup with Providence this past weekend for the field hockey team has been viewed by many as a make or break game, Sierra. With their playoff hopes on the line, the Bobcats look to capitalize Saturday at Johnson Field. Quinnipiac and Providence playing big playoff implication, implications in this one, Sierra. We're going to get right into the second half. Providence on the attack right here. Paul, ball off the post, and it's eventually going to go in. Sylvia Miller taps it right in there off the post. one nothing Providence. Big goal for the Friars, but Quinnipiac would respond. Angie Kim blasts one right past the Providence keeper less than two minutes after Providence's goal. It's all tied up at 1-1, and this one would have to be decided in overtime as the Providence goaltender shuffles one away at the end of regulation right there. Now we're going to go to overtime, Sierra. Providence would be on the penalty corner right here. Ball's moved around the circle, and it's put right past Golini in goal for Quinnipiac there. Providence goes on to win 2-1. and when we play on Monday at Brown and for the rest of the week, it's, that's a constant struggle. And for us to have all the pieces of the puzzle coming together and to miss that piece, you know, that's fixable. Um, and how fast we can do that, I guess, it's going to be up to the staff and the coaches um, and also you know, the, the resilience of our players. After the heartbreaking overtime loss to Providence, Becca Main's squad got a little breather from Big East play as Quinnipiac faced off against the Brown Bears. The Bobcats rebounded nicely as they beat the Bears 2-0 behind goals from Angie King and Dana Barlow. Quinnipiac resumes conference play against Old Dominion Friday morning at 11.30. And now our own Brian Schwartz is actually sitting by with head coach Becca Main right now to discuss the overtime loss as well as much, much more. Guys? Thanks, guys. I'm here with the Quinnipiac women's field hockey coach, Becca Main. So, Becca, what was the toughest challenge moving to the Big East? I think moving to the Big East for us when we first thought about it was having the strength and the speed. So we spent a good solid year on that and I'm pretty comfortable with where we are in, in that aspect. Um, I think 
the schedule is very different. For the Big East, you play one Big East game every week for eight weeks. We were used to a max schedule where everything's slammed into three weeks. There's the pros and the cons, but for us, to go from conference to non-conference non and then back again has been very difficult, something um, we're still trying to figure out. So I'd say that would be the biggest challenge. And then, you know, the level of hockey for us is at the top level. It could be one of the top conferences in the country. So being able to play that and sustain that for 70 minutes or, or plus minutes is, has been uh, a challenge for us. Absolutely. So since this senior class was here in the transition from the MAC to the Big East, what has this class meant to the program? You know, even looking at Savannah Riley, she's been in three different conferences. She came in in, in the NEC and she went to the MAC and now in the Big East. So the excitement level, is, is, there's nothing compared to, to switching conferences and changing it and addressing the unknown. And being having the opportunity to be the first program going into the Big East, um, kind of leading the, the charge for everyone behind in terms of where we're going as a university, it's really exciting. I couldn't do it with a better group. Our, our three seniors right now are really embody exactly what you want in a Bobcat, exactly what you want to represent uh, the Big East. You want to put them at the forefront of everything you're doing. So uh, you got to have the right leadership and the leadership for us is definitely um, not lacking and probably one of our strengths. You talk about the leadership of your older players. What about one of your newest players, Olivia Golini? She recorded her first collegiate shutout against Brown. What does that do for her confidence going forward? Sure, we have a really nice infusion of young players, and Livy leads that group in terms of the minutes that she's been playing um, and what she's done. She has a gut instinct, um, very much of a perfectionist. She is the future for us in the cage. So it's been really exciting to play um, with her. You know, we thought we would struggle in the goalkeeping area losing Megan Conaboy, and who was really one of the top goalies we've ever had. So we knew we would struggle there. It's been interesting to see that Livy has stepped so nicely into the role. She's a huge presence, almost six feet tall. So for us, that gives us the opportunity to do things that you, you just can't teach somebody strength and reach and height. So she's been brilliant for us in the cage, and, and she is the future of that class. Her whole entire freshman class has really been very instrumental in what we're doing moving forward. Uh, Savannah Riley is the team leader in goals. What has made her so successful on the offensive side? Unbelievable work ethic and uh, really truly an unbelievable human being. She leads by example. Uh, we, we don't always use that because leading by example sometimes means you're hoping for things to happen. But um, we had a moment at Providence game where she just got so fired up. She came from behind a player and hit the ground like I'm getting the ball. And we all kind of laughed because that's the intensity that she brings to every practice, every game, every film. She's a student of the game. And that's what she's teaching. And that's kind of the legacy that she's leaving behind is really study the game, learn the game, know the game. Overall, your favorite moment from this season is? My favorite moment of the season is uh, we went to Michigan State University and had the opportunity to get tickets on the 50-yard line at a football game. And I sat there with the team, and they all turned around, and they said thank you, and they were so grateful for it to have this opportunity. And it was that aha moment where you kind of take a breath and think, wow, this group's pretty special. They have the attitude, the gratefulness, they're gracious, unbelievable athletes. So I'd say the Michigan State football game. All right, well, thank you, Becca, for joining us tonight. Back to you guys at the desk. Andrew, do you know how I know how hockey season's back? Uh, is it cold? It was like 38 <laughs> degrees this morning. No, because I drove past the shuttle stop at 4 p.m. and there was a line halfway to, down Bobcat Way of people already in their game day gold for a 7 o'clock game. The men's ice hockey team took on Northeastern in its first home stand of the regular season. Let's see how the Bobcats fared in game one. Up at the High Point Solutions Arena, it was packed for the first time this year. New banners, they made it to the East Regional Championships, and then to Tampa for the Frozen Four into the first period. Brogan Rafferty's shot goes high, but it's found around the back of the net. Andrew Taverner with a wide open net. He goes top shelf, but they're gonna have to take another look at this one because the goalie was nowhere to be found. Was this goalie interference that allowed Andrew Taverner to be so free and find the net so easily? But the refs did review it and then come back out on the ice and call it good. Bobcats fans happy about that one. Into the third period now. Brendan Collier beats out Connor Clifton for a one-on-one, -on -one, but he is stuffed by Chris Truel, who was amazing in this series. And then six minutes left in the third period, Bo Peeper finds the back of the net. Quinnipiac fans thought that that was the game winner, but Northeastern had other plans. They knew they still had a trick up their sleeve. This shot from just inside the blue line deflected in with 53 seconds left in regulation. It is going to be sent into overtime, but in the final five minutes of play, neither team was able to find the back of the net, and it would end in a 2-2 tie.
get some guys in some new roles tonight, and, and some really stepped up. I thought Chris Schroeder was really good. I thought um, uh, our freshman D played well. So uh, we, there's some good positives. Aldrich was good. Shuddy was really good up front. Um, and then on the flip side, we just got to clean some areas up. We, we panicked a little bit with the puck. Some of our better players panicked a little bit. So we'll, uh, we'll clean it up. We'll be, we'll be better tomorrow. All right, Sierra, a frustrated Rand Pecknell and a frustrated Quinnipiac squad. Let's see if they can get it done in game two. First period right here, Quinnipiac coming in on offense. Bo Peeper's going to lose the puck, but it's going to come right to Carlos Chuksta. His first goal as a Quinnipiac Bobcat for the Latvian freshman. He's pumped up, so is the crowd, so are his teammates. Going on into the second period, Quinnipiac on offense again. A lot of helter-skelter action going on in front of Northeastern's crease. Tim Clifton's gonna hop on the puck and somehow it's gonna score it in. He did it all year last year. Very, very good player in front of the net. And you see it right there, Quinnipiac up 3-0 at that point. In the third period now, Northeastern with a great opportunity on the five on three. However, Chris Truel and the Bobcats defense were up to the task. Northeastern taking shots from the low right circle, from the blue line. Nothing was able to get past the Quinnipiac defense as they were up to the task in the third period. Northeastern with another power play opportunity right here on the five on four. Quinnipiac doing a nice job killing it off. However, a very nice play by Northeastern right there. They tip it in. The stick was ruled underneath the crossbar, so that goal is going to count. It's 4-2 at that point. Quinnipiac up. However, it would be a little bit too late for the Huskies as Tim Clifton will put in his second goal of the game, an empty netter. Right there, Quinnipiac wins 5-2. to two. And Sierra, what an exciting weekend up at High Point Solutions Absolutely. Arena. The men's ice hockey team looked, to, looked fantastic coming off the crushing national championship loss last season. Sierra, you and Kyle Lavasser broke it all down after covering both games this weekend. I don't think the penalty box store stopped swinging tonight, Kyle, at High Point Solutions Arena at, in Game 2 of Quinnipiac vs. Northeastern Series. I'm Sierra Goodwill, joined alongside Kyle Lavasser. Last night in Game 1, Quinnipiac and Northeastern tied 2-2 two to two in overtime, but tonight Quinnipiac's defense prevailed and brought them to a 5-2 win. Kyle, the shot blocking tonight, the penalty kill all around the back line for Quinnipiac. It's extremely impressive. 24 block shots and killed numerous amounts of penalties. What did you see from that? Well, Sarah, it's two top 15 teams. Quinnipiac being number two, Northeastern number 15. Rand Pecknell thinks that Northeastern should be, even be a top 10 team in the country. So obviously, taking advantage on the penalties has to be key. Like you said, 48 minutes on the penalty. Northeastern, one for 10 uh, with one power play goal. They only had 12 shots. Quinnipiac's ability to stop them while on the penalty kill was the story of this game. Quinnipiac also had two power play goals, a big difference. Uh, Tim Clifton, I talked to him after the game, assistant captain this year, he was just so proud in his team's ability to go out there and block shots. He said that anyone on that, on that bench will go out there on the ice and take one right in the chest for the team. 24 block shots. I mean, that's the difference in the game. 24 block shots versus Northeastern's nine. Crazy. For the full version of The Rebound, head to our website at q30television.com. But when we come back, Gabby Rigge breaks down the offensive execution of the number two women's ice hockey team on the touch screen. And it was already senior day for the women's soccer team as they took on Canisius this past weekend. Don't go away. We'll be right back on Sports Pause. Welcome to Sports Pause. In the end, we're here to win the championship this year. Jess Fontaine now has that. She's going to take a ripper off the post, but she's going to come back. And my number one, hold your applause, Bobcats fans, is Quinnipiac. All right, Victoria, you know what time it is. It's top five plays of the week. My favorite time. All I could really go for a Rain Mike sub right now. 
come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken and cheese for just over four dollars. Giant cheesesteak subs and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as four seventy-five. Q cash accepted, just a mile down the road on Whitney, here at Ray and Mike's. Welcome back to Sports Pause. After a 2-0 start to the season after sweeping Maine, the women's ice hockey team had its first road trip this past weekend. It had the short travel to stores on Friday night to take on UConn and then went up north to take on New Hampshire the next day. First, let's see if the Bobcats were able to tame the Huskies. At the Freedis Ice Forum, Quinnipiac and University of Connecticut both 2-0 to start the season. Let's head right into the first period. It was a defensive battle in the first period, but here Maria Macario has a potential breakaway, but she is stuffed by Sydney Rossman, who has been fantastic so far in the early season. Still 0-0. Now in the final seconds of the first period, Quinnipiac on a power play. Baumgart finds the captain. Emma Woods on the side. Slabs it home. One-timer past the UConn goalie. A great goal from the senior captain to put Quinnipiac up 1-0 after a tough defensive battle in the first period. Now in the second, another Quinnipiac power play. Kenzie Prater winds up from the point, but it goes far down. That's as close as it gets, Andrew, but it is protected by the UConn goalie, and it's still 1-0 after the second period. Into the third now, TTC and Ferrano making it look easy, dangling through the defenders and scores on the open net. Quinnipiac goes on to win this one 3-0 to stay perfect so far in the young season. This is Sydney Rossman's second straight shutout. Certainly. You know, they're a team that is, they're hard to play against. You know, they compete, they battle. Um, and that first period, I think they outplayed us, you know, and it, it was a... It was a really good moment for our team just to, to wake up a little bit and say, okay, like we're the team that's usually the hard to play against team. We're the team that usually wins those battles, and we didn't in the first period. And I thought it changed. You know, We made a conscious effort. Our kids decided to play a different way, and, and we kept that momentum in the second and the third. Cassandra Turner's squad continued their dominance in non-conference play as they defeated UNH 3-0 on Saturday. Sydney Rossman was excellent once again, recording 14 saves for her third shutout of the season. And it was a milestone day for freshman forward Kenzie Prater as she scored her first career goal. The Bobcats travel to Pennsylvania next weekend to take on Mercyhurst. And the USCHO pairwise rankings have been updated and it's an all ECAC top two Sierra as St. Lawrence surprisingly comes in at number one while Quinnipiac claims the number two spot. Wisconsin comes in at number three followed by Clarkson and Boston College to round out the top five. And Andrew, when it's hockey season, who else but Gabby Riggi to join us? She got a hold of the touchscreen to break down some of the scoring opportunities Quinnipiac has had so far this season. Hi guys, I'm Gabby Riggi, and I'm going to be breaking down the most recent game tape from women's ice hockey to talk about the new system they've enacted after losing a bunch of key offensive forwards from last season due to graduation. So we're going to start with the play here in the corner. There's a little bit of defensive positioning going on here, as we'll see. Maine has the opportunity, but they have all of these forwards facing the other way. Even the goaltender has our eyes towards the back of the net with the puck. But there are players here, here, and the opportunity to someone to come in this way. There's a lot of open space as the uh, defense for Maine has collapsed. And as we see coming forward, they get the puck in the corner, get it sent up to the middle, and Sion Ferrano gets the opportunity there. As we go back to, she uses the two different main defenders here and here to go and challenge the puck. They're using her as a screen to prevent her goaltender from seeing anything. The stick check doesn't really do much as she'll end up with the puck about here and her stick here. Sian Ferrano is able to whip it back and get the goal in to get the Bobcats on the board. Here we see again play is off in the corner. The defense for Maine has collapsed a little bit down low. Sian Frano uses the wraparound as an opportunity to draw players in. So we see the defender here and here. No one has come in from up top, and we have the opportunity again to have more Bobcats players rush into the center slot to get those opportunities. Sian Frano doing a good job there of bringing those players farther back and into the corner to get them to pull farther down. The forwards haven't completely collapsed in from the blue line yet to cover the players that are in the middle. So we see Sam Miskevich. In close, gets the opportunity for a good goal. Again, positioning. The defense for Maine here wasn't that sharp in this game to, to a little bit of a critique, but there's a lot of opportunity in open space that Quinnipiac was able to find and use as a part of their cycling system. So here we see we have one defender who's following the play here as it's off in the corner. This defender should be tackling Turner here in front. 
This defender should either be going up high to try to challenge Tabin back here or working to back up more and take care of Turner. So here we have this whole swath of open ice here at center and it forward with a lot of space and opportunity in down low. As we see the play come out a little bit, there's a little bit of a puck battle here. Sam Miscavige able to knock it into the corner. And as we saw, because there was so much open ice in the middle, there's opportunity for players to come in with plenty of space in the slot. The puck's still loose. Turner's able to come in. There are forwards still down in front from behind the net over here. And there's the opportunity for Taven if she wants to hook back in on the blue line to come in and go and challenge that puck as well. Sam Miscavige there able to hold on, get that uh, puck in open ice, and get the goal there for QU. Moving back to fall sports, the women's soccer team faced Manhattan on Wednesday, which was also 2-2 two two in the MAC coming into the game. The first half was a defensive battle, and the score was 0-0 after 45 minutes. But then seven minutes into the second half, Nadia Gill put the team on her back, as she has done many times before, and scored what ended up being the game-winning goal. The Bobcats 1-0 win over the Jaspers, who lost in the MAC championship game last year, will give them an edge come tournament time. And Quinnipiac also faced Canisius this past week and pulled out another big win. Alex Pelletier led off the scoring for the Bobcats and sparked a huge offensive rush. Nadia Gill scored 25 seconds later. Then Madison Borowick found the back of the net just a minute and two seconds after that. A total of three goals in just over three minutes. That brings Quinnipiac to an 8-4-1 record overall and 4-2 in the conference. And when we come back, the men's soccer team is slowly building up momentum in the conference. But can they keep it up against Manhattan and Canisius? And we'll show you the most impressive plays in Quinnipiac Athletics from this past week. Top 5 Plays is coming up next. Don't go away. We'll be right back. And welcome to Sports Pause. In the end, that we're here to win a championship this year. Jess Fontaine now has that. She's going to take a river off the post, but she's going to come back. And my number one, hold your applause, Bobcats fans, is Quinnipiac. All right, Victoria, you know what time it is? It's top five plays of the week. My favorite time. Oh. Welcome back to Sports Pause. The men's soccer team played host to Manhattan this weekend in a pretty big MAC conference, MAC game. Men's soccer team hosting the Manhattan Jaspers. Manhattan struggling this year as it was last in the MAC standings heading into this game. First half, Eamon Whalen is going to intercept the ball right outside the 18, but Manhattan's goaltender is going to make a nice save. And Manhattan's goaltender would struggle in this one a little bit, but he would recover nicely. Rashawn Daly with the shot saved by the Manhattan goaltender. However, Matthew Taylor is bodied inside the 18. That's a penalty shot. Ryan Scheiderman would line up over and he would deliver. Fooling goaltender going to the left side, goalie going to the opposite side. More Quinnipiac on offense. The ball is going to be deflected, pinballed around the 18. Sierra off the goal post. Going into the second half, Quinnipiac still up 1-0. Manhattan again playing well on defense. Rashawn Daly is going to deliver one into the box here. And it's finally going to be headed in by Whalen. He was lethal in the air in this game. He wasn't done. Nice little flick on right there. Quinnipiac would go on to win. Over nothing. You saw it. The freshman Eamon Whalen is a huge reason why the men's soccer team is tied for first place in the conference right now. He currently leads the team in goals with seven and is averaging 1.17 points per game. In the first four MAC games, Whalen has scored three goals, and he's going to be the threat that this team looks to in, in times of need since he has proved so far that he performs under pressure. And after taking care of Manhattan earlier in the week, Eamon Whalen and the men's soccer team traveled to upstate New York to take on Canisius. Rashawn Daly was the hero, scoring the game-winning goal in overtime. It was the first goal of the season for the sophomore forward. Chris Yakovides registered his, his second straight shutout and his fifth of the season. 
Quinnipiac continues conference play Wednesday as it travels to take on the Iona Gales. And the rugby team's dominance continued in Providence as it rolled over the, over the Brown Bears 77-7. Six different players scored the Bobcats' first six tries, proving just how dangerous this team is. Flora Poole led the way with three tries. Haley Watt and Alona Marr each added two. The next game for Quinnipiac, though, was a huge one. It travels across the country to play Central Washington on Saturday. Central Washington is the last team to ever beat the Bobcats. It defeated Quinnipiac 33-12 in Hamden last fall. And Sierra, we're in the thick of the fall season. Teams are fighting for playoff spots while others are cruising along. Josh Silverman, Drew Feinberg, and Kyle Vassar discuss each team in a new segment called Over Under. Welcome to a new segment we are calling Over Under. I'm Josh Silverman, alongside me is Drew Feinberg and Kyle Lavasser. Guys, how are you doing today? Good. Great to be here, Josh. So the way this segment will work is I will ask e each of them a different question about the various teams on, on campus, and they will answer on the whiteboard. Boys, the first question is this. The win women's rugby team totaled 414 points last season. Do you think they would top that this year? Uh, 414 points. In the regular season. Regular Only season in the regular only. season. It was 414 Origins. last year in the regular season. This is the same thing. Kyle, looks like you beat Drew. Yep. What, what's your answer? I got to go with under, Josh. And let me be crystal clear. This has nothing to do with how Becky Carlson's squad's been playing because they've been playing excellent. And they've actually had a higher points per game average than last year. Last year, they averaged 41.4 points per game. This year, it's just under 50 at 49.4 points per game. The only reason that they won't uh, surpass their point total from last year is because they're playing less games. They have two less games from last year, uh, and one of them is, get, is against Central Washington, who they've had trouble with in the past. But let me be clear, they've been playing excellent. The scoring is higher than last year. Uh, they've got great depth with Flora Poole, Alona Marr, Emily Roskop. There's so many different players that can score at any given moment. I gotta agree with Kyle. I gotta go under. I mean, the team is playing amazing playing the best they've ever played, coming off the national championship. I gotta agree with Kyle, they're playing less games, which is a factor, they're still playing really well, but they're also running into a Central Washington team who they've, as Kyle said, had trouble with. I think they're gonna be close to the 414 point mark, but I don't think they're gonna surpass it. And here's the thing, their last game last season they scored 100. So that definitely changed the number, so you guys will have to read on this one. Now moving on to men's soccer. <laughs> Eamon Whalen, you mentioned him. He has seven goals on the season that leads the team. He's a big part why this corner PX men's soccer team is three and one. Do you think he would finish the season? They have five games left above nine, over under nine and a half goals for the rest of the season. Uh, I could see him definitely finishing with 10 goals as he already has seven on the year. He's second in the MAC in goals this year as a freshman. Okay, that's why they've been so successful and that they're three and one in the MAC. Uh, and also, uh, the Bobcats face four opponents in the remaining part of their schedule that uh, are in the bottom of goals allowed in the conference. Okay, so they're gonna face teams that don't have great defense. He's gonna get those opportunities uh, and I could definitely see him finishing with 10 to 11 goals. Uh -huh. Great yeah. minds think alike. I'm gonna agree and go over. He already has seven goals. There's six games left. He leads the team in shots. He leads the team in goals, shots on goal, and game winners. I think he's going to get over 9.5. He just needs to convert more of his chances. He only has 41% of his shots go on goal. I think if he um, raises that stat, then he's definitely I mean, going to score more goals, obviously. So I think by the end of the season, he will have more than 9.5 goals. All right, great. Thank you guys so much. And uh, back to you guys at the desk. And Sierra, we saw it there in the over-under segment. The anchors were talking about the fall sports teams. But just to recap a little bit of what happened with some other teams this past weekend, both tennis teams, the men's and women's teams, swept Ryder, didn't even drop a single set. Impressive. And the Quinnipiac women's golf team finished fifth out of 11 teams in the Quinnipiac Classic. Andrew, the show is wrapping up. And guess what that means? It is time for Top 5 Plays of the Week. Sponsored by B&D Deli Works, they're open for both breakfast and lunch, so be sure to stop in and try the Quinnipiac Panini or the Q-Dog Sub. Andrew, I'm going to grab the odds on this one. Love me some Q-Dogs here. <laughs> Coming in at number five, field hockey versus Providence. Off the penalty corner, Angie King puts it back, makes it look easy. Quinnipiac lost in overtime, one to two. 
and Sierra. This play looks familiar. Uh, Quinnipiac men's soccer. Ryan Scheiderman on the penalty kick right there, fooling the goalie. Quinnipiac will win that game 4 0. And at number three, women's ice hockey versus UConn. Cianfrano goes down, but Bongar finds it at the point, gets it over to Captain Emma Woods, who one times it past the goalie. Quinnipiac won that game 3 0. To remain perfect. And some more Quinnipiac men's soccer, because who doesn't love some men's soccer? Eamon Whalen was on fire in this game. A nice little flick on header right there, looking like he's playing in the Premier League. Quinnipiac won big in this one. And I think we all knew this was going to be the top play of the week. Chase Prisky deflects a pass off the defenders. He's wide open, no one in sight, fakes the shot, dangles past the goalie. Quinnipiac wins that game 5-2 to two against Northeastern in the second game of the series. Chase Prisky saying, don't mind if I do on that one. Absolutely. And that'll do it for this edition of Sports Buzz. Be sure to check out all of our content at Q30Television.com. And also be sure to follow us on social media at Q30Television. For Sierra Goodwill, I'm Andrew Badillo. We'll see you next time here on Sports Pause.